Today, we're going to be watching a video by J. Walker Willis of Cold Case Christianity called What is the Best Evidence for the Bible? I have not seen this video, so I don't know yet. Let's check it out and find out. So now we're, we're starting to work through the Gospels, given those four attributes of reliable eyewitness testimony. Uh, were they written early enough? Can they be corroborated in some way? Have they changed their story over time? And are they in some way unaffected by bias? Okay. Okay, let's stop here for a second, just so I can talk about it before he does. Now, I want you to decide how you feel about these things when given very simple explanations, and then we'll go on to what he has to say. The first one is, were they written soon enough? Would you consider it soon enough if I wrote about a very complex, intricate story that happened in my life 30 years later, let's say? Um, think about something from your own life 30 years ago. If you wrote about it today, how many people do you know who were also involved in it that would dispute practically everything you said? Um, how reliable are memories that are 30 years old? What about 60? Um, the next one is corroborated. So let's assume that uh, I am writing about it 30 years later and someone else is writing about the same thing 60 years later. Uh, but neither one of us was there for it. How corroborated do you think this is? Um, the stories match up. Uh, are there different narratives? Let's assume four different people are writing about the same stories between 30 and 60 years ago. Um, and they all have slightly different details for their stories. Like the, the last words of a person who is dying are different in three of the stories. And one of them doesn't have any. Um, or, or even has the same words as another story. Um, let's assume the, the narratives of a person's birth are different, for example, and they have to like bend over backwards to make it work together, something like that. Is that reliable? Uh, bias. Uh, am I unbiased if I'm trying to convince you of something through this story? With those things in mind, let's continue. We talked about whether they're early enough, and they are. But maybe they're just an early lie. How do we still, well, we need to ask some more questions. Can we corroborate the statements of the gospel authors in any way? Now, there are two ways you can ever corroborate uh, an eyewitness's statement. One, have they been internally consistent? Do they make uh, self-refuting statements? Do they, do they uh, say things that are not even consistent with what they said yesterday or what they said a few minutes ago? So we're looking always when we talk to eyewitnesses to see if they're internally um, consistent. Important note, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, the authors of those books are unknown, as are the authors of 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and about half of what Paul is alleged to have wrote. Not that it matters really that much for Paul, because he didn't even meet Jesus, but um, every writing we have, allegedly from people who knew Jesus, not from people who knew Jesus. I think that is a very important thing to point out here, but I think another thing is simply this. Uh, as I pointed out a second ago, the narratives of Jesus' last words are all different. Um, as are the birth narratives. I mean, they bent over backwards trying to figure out how to place Jesus in Bethlehem to meet the prophecies when he was from Nazareth. They literally, like, invented a whole story of the genocide of innocent people during a census where you had to return to the homeland of your people a thousand years ago. Let's assume a census today was held where you had to return to the homeland of your people 300 years ago. How many of you would be able to do that? Uh, so, how much more likely was it that they would have you do that in ancient times? That seems like a really bad way to hold a census. So yeah, there are lots of details in these stories that don't add up with each other. A second way we might do is to say, well, is there anything other than the witness, outside of the witness, unaffected by the witness, that might corroborate the statement of the witness? So we're always looking at internal corroboration and external corroboration. Corroboration is not dependent on the witness at all. I think we can do the same thing with the Gospel authors. So when we're talking about these two kinds of categories, internal and external evidence, and we apply this to the... Important to note that technically the Gospels themselves would be external evidence, since, again, nobody involved with them ever knew Jesus. They would be external by default. I'm curious what else he means by that, though. Gospel authors. Is there some way we could check these both internally and externally? Yeah, there is. Let's start with that category of internal evidence. One of the things that struck me immediately as I was reading through the Gospels for the very first time as an unbeliever was what I call unintentional eyewitness support. I should note here uh, the, that this man claims, or claimed at least, that he became a Christian after becoming a detective, that he was a very important cold case detective. Notice, they're never like mediocre detectives or lawyers or journalists or what. They're always like the top of the field in demand. He claims to have been an in-demand cold case lawyer, or not lawyer, but a detective, getting him confused with like Lee Strobel here. Uh, he, he lied, that's not true. 
Um, he also became a Christian before he became a detective. So another inconsistency in his story. So we know we are dealing with a man who is himself a liar off the bat. So keep that in mind. Unintentional eyewitness support. I've given a couple of examples of this in your participants guide. This is when you have one witness who comes in and says something to you, offers a statement, and you're thinking to yourself, really, how in the world could that be true? Are you sure? And I said, well, this is what I saw. And it's, they leave you hanging with some open, uh, unanswered question that, sure enough, you don't even get answered until you speak to a second witness a day later. And then they offer the missing piece, the detail that makes sense of the first eyewitness account. This happens all the time in criminal investigations. Uh, let me give a guess here. I just So I think what he's getting at is that Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies written in the Old Testament, which is, first of all, not the case. Um, and there's a reason why the Jewish people don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't meet the criteria for being the Messiah. Um, but I digress. I digress, therefore I am. Um, I think like this point is very silly because it's not like Jesus wouldn't have known about the old prophecies. Um, let's say that there's a prophecy that the Messiah was going to be riding a donkey into Jerusalem. Um, he would have known about that, so he could have done something like stealing someone's donkey and riding it into Jerusalem. He could have done that. Plenty of cases of that kind of thing. They always like to do this thing where like, the Bible has this thing that, that doesn't seem to mean much in like the, the past, and then the future all of a sudden it means something because something happened somewhere. Look, if you are taking a, if, if you got like a guidebook to your actions in the future, um, it doesn't take much to fulfill the actions within. Like, prophecies are easy to fulfill once you have an understanding of what they are. Like, once they're out there, if they are prophecies that can be fulfilled by a person, like riding a donkey into Jerusalem, it's very easy to fulfill them. This isn't rocket science. This isn't rocket surgery. This isn't rocket anything. Very simple stuff, my guy. It is the earmark of reliable eyewitness testimony when you have unintentional support that fills in the gaps one to the other and puzzles together and makes sense of the account. That's why we want more than one witness to tell us what happened. Something very similar happens in the Gospels. Let me give you an example of this. In one I am glad he's going to the Gospels because I really don't like it when Christians do the whole, look, he fulfilled prophecies written about in the Old Testament. He couldn't have possibly known about the Old Testament, could he? I don't like when they do that. So this, much better. Count in the Gospels. Jesus is in front of Caiaphas, and, uh, and he's being tested. And a challenge is posed to Jesus. Oh, you think you're God? Okay, how about this? Someone strikes him and he says, prophesy, Jesus. Tell us who hit you. That's the account, that's it? Yeah, well, how hard would that be for Jesus to tell the person who hit him who hit him? That would be very easy, wouldn't it? You just, well, look, dude, you just hit me. I just saw you do it. If all you had was that one eyewitness account, this, this idea that somehow Jesus' ability to identify his attacker shows his, his divinity, that's like, it makes no sense at all. Of course, there's another account out there, I've listed it for you in your participant's guide, that tells us we are supposed to have a participant's guide here, which is maybe why I feel a bit lost about where all this is going. My apologies. I'll have my participant's guide next time. Why this would actually be prophecy. In the second account, we learned that Jesus was blindfolded at this point. That was not offered by the first eyewitness. That was left out, so it made no sense. Or maybe they made up the blindfold part to make that other one mean something. Did you ever think about that, my guy? I mean, if you're adding on details later to make a story better, that seems like a pretty good one to add, doesn't it? That's when he first said it, but now we know he was blindfolded. The second witness puts together and fills in the gap, puzzles together. It's this unintentional eyewitness support. The second person uh, made that up. Now, years later, I discovered there was someone had been writing about this, even a century before I had been investigating it, and had called these the undesigned coincidences. J.J. Blunt wrote a book called The Undesigned Coincidences of the... What do you mean, undesigned coincidences? This looks like an intentional, designed thing. Uh, it, it looks like what I described earlier with regards to the Old Testament and how people in the New Testament took things from that to make Jesus appear more legitimate, uh, even if they had to bend over backwards to do it. It looks like that, doesn't it? The Gospels. Oh my goodness, I had never uh, even heard of those kinds of things uh, described that way, but I had identified these in my work forensically in the Gospels because I saw how the Gospel...
Forensically? What does that mean in this case? Did he take like a magnifying glass and find some fingerprints in there? Is that what happened here? Counts came together in exactly the kind of way. Like, I get that he's a detective, but come on, my dude. That is not the proper context to be. You're talking about the Bible here. This is historical research. This is scholarship, isn't it? Way we would expect this kind of internal evidence, this kind of internal corroboration. But there's more, of course, internally, right? Did, did, for example, do the writers mention the right cities? The right names? Well, uh, why would that? No, not all the time, in fact. I mean, think about this. Uh, I don't know about cities specifically, but there are two separate genealogies of Jesus, which both of them include Joseph for some reason, even though Joseph isn't Jesus' dad, allegedly. But they all include Joseph for some, but they both include Joseph for some reason, and they both have different lists of names going all the way back to Jesus' original descendants in these tribes. Isn't that very curious? I mean, they get the names wrong. And they're, I mean, not only wrong, there's a different number of them in each one. That's a pretty big problem, isn't it? That'd be important, Jim. Well, because there are other late gospels written centuries after the life of Jesus. Did you know that? They're written in places like North Africa and different regions. And yeah, I knew that. I mean, there's plenty of sources of that. I bet the average Christian doesn't know that, though. In Egypt, places where people didn't know the cities around Jerusalem in Israel. They didn't know those cities by name, the small little cities. The gospel authors apparently did, though. They actually mentioned them by name, but the late heretical... I don't think anybody is necessarily saying that the authors of the gospels weren't from that area. All we're saying is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not, in fact, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, pretty simple stuff, isn't it? I mean, they are anonymous. We don't know who they are. We know what languages they wrote in, but we don't know who they are. Gospels that aren't true, they don't know those cities at all. As a matter of fact, usually the only city that's mentioned in those is Jerusalem, the big cities. They don't know the minor cities, but the gospel authors did. Even better yet, I've mentioned in a, a, a study that was done several years ago in which uh, a researcher looked at all the names of, 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 of men and women, Jewish men and women in the first century. Then it turns out the most popular names for Jewish men in Egypt in the first century were very different than the most popular names for men, Jewish men in Israel. And it turns out when you do all the study that the gospel authors get it right. They just happen to know what the most popular names for men and women were in the first century in Israel. Well, Why is he like harping on this point so hard? Why is he trying to prove that the authors of the Gospels were uh, apparently from the area of modern-day Israel and Palestine. Why is he, like, going so hard on that when I don't think that's really much of a dispute in the first place? Um, what is he trying... What is he getting at here? Is he, like, trying to counter some specific point in the scholarship that I'm not aware of? Or <laughs> what is the point? I think I know the point, though. I think that the point is just simply, like, He's trying to use something that's actually very irrelevant to the truth of the Gospels to say they are real. To, I mean, well, he's he's laying the groundwork for saying they are real by taking stuff that, like, nobody disputes, really, or very few people dispute, or I haven't really, I haven't heard any dispute of it, at least. Um, he's taking stuff that's perfectly fine to say and think and all that and acting like it's some big, giant revelation when it's not. Um, that, I guess, makes the rest of his case more solid, it seems like, to other people. I mean, they're like, well, if he's making the case for this information so solid, if people question this stuff and, and they're wrong about that, then the other stuff that he's saying must also be right, but no. And even if he's wrong here, which, by the way, he could be, I don't know. I mean, like, I've read a lot of scholarship, but I don't know everything. There's a lot that I haven't read. Um, maybe he's disputing something in specific. I don't know. What I do know is this. This man is a liar. He lies. Well, why do they know? Because they're actually reporting it at the time as they knew it. This is yet another evidence this is not late and it's not written out of the region. These are written by people who knew the geography, who knew the cities, who knew even the names that were used for the people who live there. But now let's take a shift and move from internal evidence to external evidence. How would we know, is there anything externally that would help us to know if um, Christianity is true as recorded in the Gospels? Well, what would we use for that? Well, here's a couple of things we could use. Archaeology is one great way to uh, confirm the, the contents of the scriptures. Now, I will tell you that all archaeology is a discipline of fractions. 
So I would never expect that every single city, every single event recorded in the New Testament, I could then find archeological corroboration for. These are very ancient claims, and uh, all of archeological uh, digs are just fractional. You don't even know, for example, what you're digging is necessarily biblical. You've only Okay, we have very, very specific locations for some things that are said to have happened, and we know that those things didn't happen. I mean, we have pretty specific locations for things like, where was the Garden of Eden? We have very specific locations for things like uh, the, the Jewish captivity and slavery in Egypt. We have very specific information about these things and no corroborating evidence. Um, Christians love to pull this thing where they're like, you know, chariots were discovered at the bottom of the Red Sea. And I mean, first of all, if that were true, I'd say, I don't know, I've, I've never really read about it, I don't really care. But if it were true, I'd say, well, so what? I mean, who cares? Who knows? Well, maybe they just threw some chariots in there when they were done with them. Like, ah, well, we're done with this thing. Bye-bye. Um, I get the feeling that they polluted a lot more in uh, the ancient world than we like to think they did. But that's irrelevant. I mean, we, we have searched all over the Sinai Peninsula for evidence that the Jewish people were wandering for 40 years. No evidence. There are specific places you could be looking for some things that you should be finding them. Um... That story about the walls of Jericho falling. Nothing. I mean, we found multiple different sites of ancient Jericho, but we have not found one site uh, there of the walls falling. That's a pretty big problem. These are all very big problems. You wouldn't expect to find everything. That's true. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't think we had very specific locations for them, but I haven't read the stories in a while, so we could, and I just don't remember it. But I don't think we have very specific information about where those would have been. So we can just go ahead and say, well, maybe that did happen and you'll never find it. But there are some things you can say with complete certainty uh, never happened because we have looked and looked and looked and the evidence is not there. We uncovered a fraction of the sites that are out there. Only a fraction of those have been cataloged. Only a fraction of those are actually New Testament sites. So there's a reason we would not expect to find everything. But I would expect to find something. Let me give you an interesting... Finding something is not good enough to prove the historical reliability of these documents. These documents have a whole lot of things in them that are very, very questionable. Now, the Old Testament for sure has a lot more, but the New Testament has more than its share. Comparison, so you can think about it. The Book of Mormon requires a thousand, uh, it actually records a thousand year history on the North American continent, describing a number of civilization groups, cities, government structures, monetary systems, and people. Yet, in all the years we've tried to dig for this, we've never discovered a single foundation of a single city, a single name from the Book of Mormon, a single inscription, a single coin, nothing to corroborate the claims of that book. Wow, that's uh, really interesting. Wouldn't it be equally interesting if we looked at the Old Testament, at something like, let's say, Moses dying and then the Israelites going in and killing all the Canaanites, if we looked at something like that, the complete destruction of Canaan, and found that there was absolutely no evidence that that ever occurred, despite the fact that people have been looking for that for a long time. Wouldn't that be very interesting if a whole story involving the narrative of Jewish people arriving in Israel, modern-day Israel and Palestine, wouldn't it be interesting if there was no evidence for that whatsoever, just like the Book of Mormon? Wouldn't that put a big wrench in your whole argument about the validity of the Bible? I wouldn't expect to see everything, but I would expect to see something. When I see nothing, I become suspicious. The claims of the New Testament are not, uh, you and me both, brother. not like that. They are rooted in history, a history that's been corroborated by archaeology. Let's go one more step. If we just looked at the non-Christian authors who report something about Christianity in the uh, first uh, century, let's say, the first hundred years after the events, what would we discover? I've got a list in your participants' guide of some ancient authors, Thallus, Tacitus, Marabar, Serapion. We discover um, a bunch of people who had nothing to say about the truth of Christianity and only mentioned the existence of Christians, people who believed in Jesus. People who did not live at the time. We have zero evidence whatsoever that Jesus actually existed in anything other than like, I mean, what's called textual criticism. You can look at the text and say there are things, the criterion of embarrassment, basically. That's all the evidence we really have for Jesus. There is no, we have no writings from anybody who met him or anybody even close to that, really. I mean, the closest is Paul, and he was writing years after the Jesus or the death of Jesus. Um, these authors, this guy mentions, these historians, they, they just note the existence of Christians, people who believe in Jesus. That's it. That's all they take note of there. That's not very compelling evidence. 
All of these are listed now in your participants guide. All I want you to do. Ah, my participants guide. Where's my participants guide? Where did it go? Oh God. Is to circle the claims about Jesus or the early Christians and to Fuck. write them on that little list I've given to you this side. I want you to see what they say about Jesus, what they say about Christians. Just circle. Where do I get this participant's guide, man? I need this. I didn't know I needed a participant's guide for a YouTube video. Why do? Why does he have this? Where do I get this thing? Pull those words and then transpose them to the list on the side. You've now just created a list of everything that non-Christians said about Jesus in the first hundred years after the fact. If you didn't have a single Christian document, you would still have that list written by non-Christians. What would you know about Jesus? It turns out you'd know. You'd only know what the historians wrote about the followers of Jesus and what they believed. I mean, that's all they wrote about. They just wrote about stories that were in these books. That's it. That's all they did. They didn't write anything new. They had nothing to add. They just said, there's these people, Christians, who believe this stuff in these books. That's it. An awful lot. That's great corroboration for us because you've got a robust description of the Christian narrative offered not by Christians in the Bible, but by non-Christians who were watching all of this in the first hundred years. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Touch point corroboration. And remember, all corroboration is touch point. If, I, if I've, some witness says, for example, that Jim sat here and touched this chair, and later on you fingerprint the chair, it's going to actually corroborate the claims of the witness. But the This guy is clearly someone who became a believer for non-rational reasons, no doubt emotional re reasons, and then uh, sought, it, sought to justify it later by doing the research, which is how it always works. Anytime somebody tells you do the research online, what does that mean? Well, that means they've found something that plays to the biases they already had, and they want you to find that, so you also begin to share their biases. That's what happened here, obviously, and that's not how you're supposed to do things if you're trying to be honest intellectually. The fingerprint's not gonna tell you anything about what I wore. It's not gonna tell you anything about what I said. So even though it's corroborative evidence, it only captures a point of the statement. Well, it turns out the internal and external evidence related to the New Testament is good touch point evidence that corroborates the claims of the New Testament author. So when we're talking about internal and Man, that was a very jarring cut, wasn't it, everybody? External corroboration. I provided an illustration in your participant's guide, right? It kind of shows that the, the broad brush strokes of the Christian narrative in the Gospels is kind of a corroborated and covered by our external corroboration. And then the, the details are then corroborated by the internal corroboration. So we're using both external and internal corroboration. By this guy's standards, if I were to write, a, let's say, a paper, or let's say I, let's say I were to do a video, about uh, J. Wilbur Wiggins here uh, doing this video. If I were to do that, technically, by his standards, that should support the existence of Jesus, shouldn't it? Um, that That's his own standard. Now, of course, that's hyperbole. I'm being hyperbolic to J. Wilbur Wiggins here um, because, yeah, that is essentially the argument he's making. He's just making it in a more roundabout kind of way. I mean, the Christians, they said a bunch of stuff in their little Gospels, and then some people later, like yeah, significantly later, like 80-plus years later, I think, I think what was it, uh, Josephus wrote the soonest, but still a long time after, like 60-plus years, right? Um, actually, wait, no, they, someone on the Internet, some random Christian told me it was like 60 years later, and I looked it up, and it was like much later than that, actually. So, like, these writings of the historians are very much after the fact, and the only thing they do is they don't add anything novel. They just point to what the Christians wrote. Um, it's it's not very good uh, evidence, is it? Um, maybe that stuff happened. Maybe it really did. E even if it did, this stuff isn't great evidence. So thanks for that, my guy. Um, I think I've wasted enough of your time with this guy. So you're welcome. Uh, have a good one. Be safe. And uh, hope to see you again very soon.